uh, just to make sure if there's anyone else popping in. So welcome everyone. Um, this is Making a Statement, Chronicling and Sharing Women's Voices Through History with Pauline Weger. And did I say that right? You could, Weger, yeah. Weger, okay, <laughs> Weger. all right. And Dr. Alicia Williamson. Uh, now is it Alicia or Alicia? It's Alicia. Yeah. Alicia, okay. I have an Alicia, that's my niece. That's why I wanted to confirm. <laughs> um, I'm Desiree, I go by Desi. I'm the adult services librarian here at the South Hadley Public Library. Um, I do all the adult programming, reference, uh, head of archives, and um, what else do I do? All the IT. So if you got computer issues, I'm your girl. Um, we have a couple things coming up for the next couple of months or next couple of weeks. Uh, we have a busy month of March. We have a laughter wellness program starting up this coming Wednesday on the 10th at 6.30. It's going to help you with your mind, body, and spirit. It's going to be for about an hour. Uh, the other thing that we do have coming up the week after on the 17th is an author talk with Richard Webb, and he's doing a talk on the origins of the Great Gatsby. He wrote a book talking about the um, ultra wealthy neighbors to um, the Fitzgeralds in Great Neck, New York. And that's where they got their idea for Gatsby. And there's some unseen photos from that family. So I, we're, I'm looking forward to that too. The last Wednesday of the month at 6.30, we're gonna have a decluttering and organizing your closet program. Have you ever started cleaning and look around an hour later and say, dear God, what I have I done? Uh, that's me. Uh, and by the way, I've slept many a time next to a pile of clothes that are next going to go in the closet the next day. So, <laughs> um, and the pile of clothes, I'm not calling my husband, I'm just saying, but yeah. <laughs> um, so if this is a program for you, um, please sign up. We have plenty of space for the end of the month. And once again, that's on the 31st. Um, all these programs can be found on our website um, at shadleylib.org and um, anyone's welcome to attend. So uh, today we're gonna talk with the co-authors of Bravely Inspiring Quotes uh, and Stories of Trailblazing American Women. Um, I am excited to say that the Odyssey Bookstore has materials available for purchase. And this program is in conjunction with their efforts. Uh, for those of you who attended, uh, we actually have, so we have the book, the library does have the book, uh, which will be available for, for reading. But for those who are attending, we'll be put in a raffle to win the journal um, and or the uh, note cards, which we will also talk about a little bit later. So I'm excited to be able to <laughs> have that available for people. I think that's that's really exciting after looking through it. It's really cool. Um, oh. For So for first time author, Pauline uh, Weger is an author, inventor and social entrepreneur mom of two daughters. She stepped away from a long time corporate career to spend her, her days building a business that creatively shares ideas and true stories. Uh, she and her husband recently relocated from Northern Virginia to Western Massachusetts. So welcome. The next person we have is Alicia Williamson, PhD, is an author, editor, and wayfaring academic who loves to use her keyboard for good. And she has researched and taught literature writing, and women's studies. Her work within and beyond the university is dedicated to amplifying underrepresented voices and stories. Originally from the Lake Country, Lake Country of Northern Minnesota, I'm assuming from the UP? <laughs> uh, Duluth, Minnesota. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, she, and uh, she currently resides in the UK, so thank you from abroad. I appreciate you coming and uh, is with her husband and two young daughters. So everyone, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, thank you for making the long virtual trek. <laughs> um, it's always fun on a Saturday morning uh, to get up and uh, kind of get going and uh, start to chat. So how did the two of you find Quota Bell and when did you meet and start working, in, um, working on this collaboration? So I had had a, a long time corporate career and had stepped away from that and had done some rebranding for a food bank outside of Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing that, I started to write a book about how to help people that are doing something impactful be known for their ideas. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I got stuck writing the book just as most people writing books do. And I started to look around for quotations that would be good ones to include. 
and, um, and meaningful, um, short words that would be a catalyst for an idea. And I was stopped in my tracks. Um, I was looking for quotations that would represent ideas by not only men, which were easy to find, but women that were inventors, scientists, artists, entrepreneurs, from not just the visible few, but from a real wide spectrum, because my thinking was that there's just so many women accomplishing wonderful things. Where are their ideas? Where are their, where's their own voice? So I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia because while I founded this um, and started out doing some research, very early on, I was introduced to Alicia. So I'll, I'll let me have you go ahead and talk about how we met up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I was very randomly at an academic conference, and I met up with a childhood friend who happened to live in that city, and uh, she uh, was a former co-worker of Pauline's, and so she told me about Pauline's project, and I thought it sounded so cool, um, and so I asked if she would uh, introduce us, and, and um, she did, and we had a call, and uh, I have been uh, working with Potabelle uh, ever since, so... Um, yeah, and, and you know, the, the founding research was really fascinating. I think that that was a huge driver um, in the beginning. That it really validated the concept that um, when you began counting, I don't know, if Pauline, you want to talk about the research underpinning the company, but. Uh, yes, yeah. so we, the, the first thing was to say, what's, what's the issue here? Like, why are we not finding women's voices? And so I actually had um, a, a someone that was getting her graduate degree do some primary research and secondary research. And what we found was it's not a barrier of people not sharing the ideas of women. It's actually a quote supply problem. And it's like, how do you chronicle and where do you capture and tag and, and also that people will find the idea. And then importantly for us is it's actually the story behind the idea that we think gives it the context. And, you know, if you think about it, quotations are used like every single day and take off the table, the, the trite little sayings that you see on social media, but they're used by leaders and writers, by teachers, by inventors, by entrepreneurs, either for um, to you know, distill some thought and catalyze a group or to prompt your thinking. So quotations in themselves are actually very um, valuable little assets if they're um, chronicled properly and shared properly. Makes yeah. sense. Make and that research actually found that less than 15% of the quotes being shared uh, every day are by women. Um, so that's really stark that, you know, a, a big gap. And with the sort of established quote anthologies, it was even worse than that. Like there were more quotes by anonymous than there were by women. So that's, it, it shows that there is a, a quote supply problem that needs to be solved. And so Quotabelle is really about creating those engaging tools that are part of the solution that makes it really easy for people to discover and share women's voices. Yep. I just keep thinking about the book. Anonymous was a woman. Yeah. You know, there's that <laughs> yeah. the biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Looking at uh, just the quote books we have here, um, it's like Barrett's, for example, and Bartlett's and things like that. Uh, it's almost, it's a, more about women than it is by women. Right. Right. And to me, that has always been an interesting. Um, to me, that's interesting that the man's voice seems to be uh, represented more so than the female voice, at least uh, for men and women. Um, and, and Desiree, I, we actually counted. <laughs> we yeah. actually had an intern that went through those um, anthologies wow. and, and analyzed it and counted what the representation was. And to your point, most of it's women's talking about being a women, woman. And it's uh, very few women that are cited. And they typically were a writer or a politician or something like that. So you, you lost this whole richness of the representation. Absolutely, absolutely. Could you tell me a little bit more about qu what Quotabel is and what its, um, you know, what's its mission? What's its what's its focus? Yeah. So um, when I started out, I I really came at it from 
thinking that we would be an online discovery um, destination and actually got a patent for the platform, Quotabel.com. Um, we had an initial round of angel investors that believed in our mission and said, okay, let's go build this. And we had a really superb development team that came up with this coding way. Um, so it's really a complex like content management system. And Alicia, again, was there from the start because we had to think about what assets we were putting into the system as well as what code we're developing and how it would all work. And, and at the same time, the Quota Bell brand was intentional because we wanted something memorable and like relatable and friendly um, that this, you know, that there's a lot of reasons why you use quotes. So we wanted it to be something that was a, an approachable brand. Um, but I pretty quickly found out that to get to the next level of development of the system would take um, a pretty significant investment and lining up another round of investors in a technical platform for this was a challenge. So Alicia and I really said, um, we listen to the community that was telling us, we love what you're doing. We get it. Can you give us something to buy? <laughs> Which I thought was fascinating. Um, and so we tested some print products. Um, we did an indie go go kind of crowdfunding campaign and got a little bit of money and we tested these products and they ended up being used by Marriott Corporation for merger integration because they were catalysts um, that they were used by some schools and by personal you know purposes and all and that's when a publisher found us and said we like what you're doing um, we like your print products, but would you consider writing a book? So it's a story of like uh, entrepreneurs, uh, social journey that takes you a different way than you really started out. <laughs> sure, and so sure. we're now on our third book and the guided journal and cards. So, so, so is Bravely your first one? This is your first? Actually our third. It's your third book, um, okay. And, and the, first, the, other? the first one was Beautifully Said. Mm -hmm. The second one was Grit and Grace. Mm -hmm. And then we, at that point, uh, they did very well in the market because our concept, Alicia and I always said, we think that we need to get women's stories off the dusty shelves and out into the world. So we wanted to create something that would, you would gift the stories of women, gift their ideas. So they're intentionally designed to be gifting um, kind of products and shareable. Um, and at after doing the first two books, we said, look, we need to have the right economic model for this because we were doing some, we research, you know, it's like, Alicia is like a phenomenal, um, you know, researcher. She digs deep into archives and I'll let her talk about it. But we, at that point, we had a literary agent pick us up, um, a really top-notch literary agent. And we are now with a new publisher that is working with us in a great partnership. We liked our first partner, our first publisher. They were terrific. They, this has now elevated us even more so in terms of how we're approaching things. Um, and I see this question from Lynette. And yes, all three books are curated collections of quotes with the stories behind them included. Um, and when we started doing the print products, yes, the idea was that they would be unique um, also because there is a digital destination for them. So that um, if you liked a quote from Beautifully Said, um, you can go and look it up on the website and dig into that quoter, as we like to call them, story uh, in, in more depth. Um, so yes, oh, well, ideally I, all of the print products will have all of the stuff online. We haven't quite caught up with Bravely yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Did, um, um, is there, is there, is, um, is Quotable a website? I haven't had a chance to look yet. It I'm definitely sorry. is. It's so it's quotabell.com. Yeah. And that really was, that was the genesis of all of this. Like a, if you can imagine, it would be the place that you would go. So if, if you were studying about Mariah Mitchell, the wonderful astronomer from, you know, whose heritage came from Nantucket, that you would find not only um, her original, you know, uh, story, but any artifacts that would go along with it. If it was someone modern day, you might find their TED talk, a book that would be related, any kind of assets that we could source that helps tell that story along with the quotations. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. So how long did it take to curate and compile the different collections? Yeah, 
Um, so I think it, our first like two years were probably on the website, Alicia, is that fair? Um, yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's right. Um, yeah, and, and Bravely, uh, bra I mean, the first book actually came quite easily because it was very much connected with sort of the initial people that we had featured uh, on, on the website, some of our favorite quotes from that. Mm -hmm. um, with Bravely, I feel like it took a couple of years to take us from concept to publication, um, uh, which was nice in a way because we had the opportunity to um, have discussions, uh, be in conversation with a couple of organizations that ultimately helped shape our research priorities for the book. So Bravely, um, the first two books covered women from around the world. Bravely is specifically dedicated to US trailblazers in US history. Um, and there was uh, some intention behind that because it was supposed to be released um, in honor of the ratification, the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So that was a major mm -hmm. milestone in US history, um, of course. So it was, it was one rationale for focusing on mainly American women. Um, although some of those are people who immigrated here. Um, are they predominantly are they predominantly uh, primary sourced materials, or would you say they're secondary sourced or a combination? Um, in terms of the quotes, the or, quotes, yeah, <clears throat> the quotes are mostly from primary sources. Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. And we had to dig in some archives to find some of them. They were very very difficult. Uh, and find. then you're also, because you're across eras, like you'll find um, some quotations are, I'll call them plain spoken in terms of, um, mm -hmm. you know, fairly easy to consume and other ones, they're more in the voice of the era. And so you might have to think about it or the way that it was articulated and you definitely see those variations in how we curated it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it does take a long time to curate the books because um, we come up with sort of the themes or the concept and then within Bravely, of course, there's 20 different chapters and each chapter has a different theme. And so we do a ton of research. We have so many spreadsheets, it's so <laughs> funny. And then a lot of the time is spent doing that research and making those editorial choices because for each chapter, what we're really looking for is finding the sweet spot where both the quote and the story are speaking to a particular theme like Bravely or Gracefully. Yeah. Um, tenaciously, those those kinds of um, themes, and also making sure that those chapters include a diversity of of background, of historical era, um, of professions, and of ideas. Uh, so it, yeah, it takes it takes a while to do, do that sort of curation. Absolutely. Was it, um, you know, as we know, women's voices have been always around, obviously. Um, but their voices were drowned out or stymied altogether. Um, how did you find capturing women's own words and experiences vital in changing and leading um, the national conversation, you know, and, and trying to, um, you know, just get, just trying to get, because even now getting our voices out just seems hard sometimes and it still seems it's better, but there's always the mansplaining. There's always the, um, that overarching sound of men trying to reformulate what you're actually trying to say. So how did you go about trying to narrow down that voice? So there's a couple of things we're doing when we choose this is to try to show the diversity of on a number of levels, including um, even the backgrounds of the people so that they're representative of um, kind of underrepresented career paths or communities or whatever it would be. Um, and I, I think one of the things I've found is there's going to always be this flood of these other voices. Um, and part of what I'd say is it's up to all of us to actually now be proactive in using the voices of women because we have typically a platform. People are sharing, like I said, quotations all the time. So again, it's, it's finding someone that's a different background. So I'm gonna give an example is um, I was in with a high school class 
and we were trying to get them to creatively do um, Instagram styling of our first book, Beautifully Said. And so like, how do we engage them in kind of their own way of thinking in their own world? And it was both young uh, women and young men. And one of the people in the book, um, so there was a young man that was in the class that wanted to study engineering. And he actually was particularly interested in cars. And the woman that he chose was a concept car designer. And so it, he was like stunned that there were females that are designing concept cars, like really slick concept cars. And her partner in designing it for the interior of the car was another female. And so it's almost like you change the dialogue when all of a sudden they see, and for the other women in the, the um, class, the young women, for them to see that women are not in these, um, what used to be kind of traditional paths. They're taking unconventional paths to follow both their passion and their interests in the sciences and in design and different paths as well. And Alicia, if you have. Yeah, and I think in terms of changing the national conversation, part of what we were trying to do with Bravely was we had noticed through our years of quote collecting that um, there were some major gaps on topics that have been traditionally associated with men, sort of things like freedom and courage and valor and innovation. And those are topics that also happen to be founding US ideals that are still widely celebrated today. So part of what the book is doing is trying to add those voices back into US history and into that national conversation uh, about those values, because of course those values mean different things to, to different people. Um, and the book is helping to reflect that range of voices that's always been there, but has been sort of occluded. So, you know, it's not just Theodore Roosevelt talking about daring and courage, but, you know, also um, Theodore Theodore Jody Williams and Fannie Lou Hamer and Simone right. Biles, you know, all of those people belong yeah. in that conversation too. Absolutely. Did you uh, try to look at just predominantly what would be considered masculine words, for example, and uh, turn them on their head to be able to real to make people realize that this is a universal word, not just a masculine word. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly that is that's okay. Exactly right. yeah. Yeah. okay. I think that's those great. words for sure. Now, sure. mind you, it still is. It was not easy to find the words of the women. Like. Um, I think part of our observation has been there's women, they're writing and they're sharing and all of that, but they're not necessarily distilling those words into a, um, a shareable concept. And so sometimes we're having trouble, we're going through someone that's very articulate, and but our thing is coming at it from is there a quotation in there? And we also know it's actually hard to come up with that distilled kind of version of it. Um, if you think about that's why speech writers exist. <laughs> that's why uh, filmmakers are very, you know, good screenwriters are good at what they do. But if we can get people starting to think about how do I take my idea and it's my idea that I'm, you know, my story and work with that and get it into a distillable way so that someone will hear it and they'll say, ah, I get it or exactly, or, you know, it'll cause that pause and reflection that actually comes with a quotation. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's one of been our, our frustrations throughout is that oftentimes with female trail, trailblazers, the quotes that are out there for them are just about them being female trailblazers instead of right. the ideas right. that made them trailblazers. Uh, Absolutely. So that we're trying to gather a lot of those, those kind of quotes. And of course, who we quote is, you know, who we give authority to in society. Right. So if we're changing the national conversation, you know, we need women to have equal sites. And I think it was so striking to me when we were starting this research and we, we found that 15% stat, how many places that that was echoed in kind of top leadership gaps in society. So it was also you know, women were only getting 25% of bylines in all major publications. And, um, you know, they only represented, well, now they represent like 24% of senators, which is higher than it's ever been, but, you know, still only a quarter. Um, there are only 7% of execs at Fortune 500 companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera 0% of US presidents. So um, it seems like that's reflected, you know, if, if we associate quotes with 
um, sort of thought leadership and with moral authority, um, those are disproportionately being attributed to men. And that's a problem. Right. 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 The, um, as professional quote collectors, <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, you know, what makes a good quote? What is it that you're, how you're drawn to what they're trying to say and, and how they're trying to say it? Alicia, do you want to do you want to take this one first? Well, yeah, I mean, and actually, I have to say, just to put in the pitch that we actually give some tips on how to craft quotes in the guided <laughs> journal. It's like okay. it's a very quotable part of the, of the guided the journal. Um, yeah, uh, so how you look at your story and think about how you might craft your own shareable quotes from it. Um, but for me, you know, obviously, like pithiness and interesting word choices matter. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what really works for us is something that is greatly enriched by its context, but doesn't rely upon it for other people um, to make meaning from it. Um, and then also one of our sort of favorite quotability things is when a quote communicates an idea in a way that also helps communicate the story of the person who said it. Um, and that can happen in all sorts of natural ways. Of course, how we talk, you know, reflects, you know, our dialect and our idiom and is interesting. Um, but also there's lots of examples that we, we tried to put in the book, like um, Bessie Smith's quote is, you know, I don't need no drummer, I, I set the tempo. Um, and so those words, I mean, that actually came literally from a recording session, um, but it, it shows that she's a musician and you know she's literally setting the tempo and then that resonates for us because figuratively, of course, we wanna march the, our own beat kind of thing. Um, so I think those kind of things make a really good quote. And there's people that do that intentionally too, like Tenley Albright has a quote that we love to use. You know, mm -hmm. if you, um, don't fall down, then you're not trying hard enough. And she was an Olympic right. figure skater. So again, she's inserting um, her own story into that meaning. Um, and that's and we, really found, it. we found sometimes that um, those quotes for people, that sometimes they're, they're, they're deliberate on thinking about it, right? That they've, they've, they've been working on their ideas and again, they're able to distill it. Sometimes it actually happens in a natural conversation and it's almost like an aha to them that, wow, uh, someone was interviewing them and really coaxed out a thought that becomes their signature thinking going forward. So there's multiple ways that those quotable quotes can actually occur. Absolutely. Um, I was, one of the questions I had was, um, how hard was it to find women's voices, particularly those from underrepresented and minority backgrounds? Um, and how are these overlooked voices inspiring up today's up and comers? Um, and then a second part to that question for me was, um, you know, I'm Mexican, I'm a Mexican Italian. You know, if you're not eating, I'm not happy is what I like to say. <laughs> but if, but there are cultural um, framing around some of those ideas and quotes that may not be understood in mainstream society. So I'm curious to know how you frame that also. So that's like the second part to that question. So the first part was how hard is it to find those quotes? Yeah, you've landed on something that is one of the hardest things we do. Um, I, I think from my perspective, and I really would love Alicia to chime in on this one is, um, there are people that I think are doing an outstanding job of curating, um, you know, for, uh, kind of underrepresented voices so that they are getting out there. So we're able to find some things, um, but it, without a doubt, that's where we have a difficult time. And part of it is translations, um, like you said, kind of contextual, what is actually coming from that environment and all. Um, so that, that remains really something that needs to be addressed. Um, I, you know, I, I think from my point of view, before I give it to Alicia is, there are people that are digitizing assets from history um, that are archivists, that are librarians and all. 
I actually think like raising their awareness to be on the hunt for something and then find it and even put it in quotabell.com, like send it to us um, that, that they, there's a way to elevate that because we're often looking at these amazing assets and we have to hunt for the, the saying within it. But if somebody's already going through that process and sees it and calls it out, it may be something to add to the, um, the asset categorizations that are being done. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, yeah, there's there's the two issues and the difficulties that sometimes, like Pauline says, there's this sort of mountain of content that is difficult to wade through. Um, but for so many people, there's just nothing available. And um, and then historically, also, of course, who has left a record? You know, there's there's issues with literacy historically. I mean, we have we have Harriet Tubman in Bravely. Um, but, you know, and historians think that she probably learned to read and write by the end of her life now, but there's no real records that she left of her own voice. We have her in Bravely because there are biographers who recorded her voice. So we include her and then we put a big asterisk on it to say, you know, there was mediation here and we don't know um, what that did to her voice. You know, it's, it's a voice that people wanted to preserve, but it wasn't her doing that that preservation. Um, in, in regards to, so once again, I said, you know, I, my background's in history, archives, uh, knowing about, for example, the slave oral histories that were taken by the Freedmen's Bureau, um, is that our oral, oh, I can't even say it, oral histories, something that eventually you might look at or is uh, because some of those, or even from the Depression era, speaking to um, the Chinese Americans coming over just before the Depression, you know, things like that, that have, that have been spoken to, is that something that eventually you might consider? Yeah, Desiree, I think that the, any uh, asset like that is going to be rich with insight of that point in time. And um, I would not rule that out, <laughs> Alicia. <is there? laughs> oh, we have, and we have definitely looked at, at oral histories um, too. But yeah, and and that's that's a perfect way of addressing you know some of these issues of yeah. issues I'm just thinking and of especially like, you know class finding yeah. people of, of particular. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's just the truth that unfortunately, who we record in archive also tends to reflect you know whose contributions we valued sure. at the time so a lot of, for a lot of the people even the people that we could find the story for um oftentimes there is no like the voices of the records have been incredible sure. like lost forever um and that yeah. so that was really frustrating for bravely especially when we we found all these firsts that we really wanted to pursue and we just could not find any primary texts whatsoever sure. Yeah, and that's hard for us because our thing is finding the quotations that first right. one. So we, we had right. to leave people out that actually we think their story is worthy. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to other languages, for example, uh, when you, I'm talking, assuming your first book had, you said from all over, it wasn't just, mm -hmm. this one's just American based, but um, was translation an issue? Like trying to find and contextualize that and the coloring of that translation? Um, Cause I know like there are sayings in Spanish that, or in Italian that just don't translate well and make no sense in English. Um, so I was just curious to know if you encountered that when working on the, the first book, for example. Yeah, well, even in this book actually, because um, we included um, Ho uh, Jovita Idar mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't find any primary text for her in English. Um, so thankfully I have a minor in Spanish and uh, <laughs> I can go in and I, I can't say that, you know, yeah. So I was, I was grappling with those issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we'll come book. across sometimes like multiple translations of something, yeah. and then you have to make a decision on wh which one you're going to rely on. Uh, you know, there's sure. there's enough nuance to the word changes that it changes the meaning, and and even the almost like the approachability of it. Like it's just a few word changes can make it a, a real difference. The one word change in the Bible messed with witches. <laughs> right it, thou should not take a poisoner compared to thou shall not take a witch you know so or that's so huge difference millions of women later 
big issue. So absolutely, <laughs> I totally get it. Um, that was a very good citation there. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of those in my head, which freak my husband out. And he'll be like, where did you get that? I'm like, sixth grade? I don't know. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's just, I, I, I and my family have always, we like quotes. We find quotes are inspiring. We find quotes are, um, uh, can push you sometimes, even like little quotes. Like my father always told me, give them the opportunity to say no, as opposed to just assume they're going to say no. Do you know what I mean? So there's little things like that that are like colloquialisms, I'm going to say more so than quotes, but it's still um, part of the lexicon, you know, and it's still things that help you along each day. And um, and Desiree, on that point, like I, I presented at a conference that had these um, CEOs of women from the energy industry and regulators and mayors and really amazing uh, array of like 120 women. I can't even begin to tell you how many actually are quotation collectors yep. and they do it for very spiritual reasons. They do it for, again, leadership reasons. They would have them on their phones. They approached me and I was like, just stunned at how pervasive it is. It's not something we talk about that I collect quotes or I use quotes or they're in my yeah. home or something like that. But, um, but it is, it is amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what was the hardest one to find? What was the hardest quote? Uh, let's stick with the Bravely book for just this one, what would you say was the hardest one in this one to find? Cause I mean, if I went over all three books, I'm sure there was a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know? Um, um, what would there you were say so many that were actually very difficult really to find. Hard. I mean, so um, I know from like, Pauline, you fell in love with uh, Julia Morgan, who was yeah. this um, rather prominent architect in her day. And she designed the Hearst Castle and yet she seemed determined to leave no record of her, her like <laughs> thoughts uh, behind. So there, I mean, there, we did ultimately find a big archive, but even within that archive, it was really difficult to find a quote out of it because most of it was like professional correspondence and just like very technical and- um, Yeah, and I love her story. It was a woman of substance who actually her legacy remains because the buildings she designed still are here um and i was just i kept telling alicia i'm gonna find something and she hunted <laughs> um so it, it's a good example of someone whose story people just need to hear because of uh her achievements and her legacy and all of that but uh but again her words are, are missing and then yeah oh, we, we really wanted to put edmund edmund neil lewis in um and we just ultimately couldn't we found some letters for her but there was just like you know, there was nothing that could be drawn for them. Um, Florence Price, who was a composer, um, who was just recently rediscovered because someone was renovating this house that they bought in the Chicago suburbs. And then all of a sudden they just found all of her old scores that just hadn't been published. And just all, all of a sudden she, you know, they realized um, that this um, composer had existed who we just yeah. completely mm -hmm. forgotten from music history and in fact she was um I think the first African-American woman maybe not African-American but the first African-American woman to have a symphony um performed by a major orchestra yeah uh, so important in music history and, mm -hmm. and she had been forgotten about so that took some digging to find quotes um but in fact, there were interviews with her in the paper at the time because, you know, she made a splash. Um, and then I think what might be most surprising is that even some people who are more contemporary than that and much better known than that, um, like Penny Chenery, um, who is the owner of Secretariat. She had her own Disney yes. biopic. <laughs> Um, and yet all the quotes that exist out there for her are like lines from the script of that movie. They're not like her own words, you know, so there was, it was very difficult, even though she was properly famous in her day and had recently been, had her story come back to the forefront. Um, there was just like not very many primary texts so available. To, me, to, me, to your point on that, Alicia, that, um, those, uh, a lot of times, if you're relying on Google for that type of a search, you're gonna get the Disney quotation for page after page after page. And so you're digging deep and going different directions. And so that's probably a, 
a fault of everyone. That's why we're trying to say, how do you find a resource that will elevate it and make it discoverable? <laughs> because otherwise you're gonna, you're gonna be picking up movie lines. <laughs> and, and yeah, and make sure that it's sourced, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was there a favorite, favorite trailblazer that from this collection that really inspired you? Um, so I, you already heard mine is Julia Morgan, I think is mine. Like I love okay. her. So Alicia is. <laughs> I've got so many, so <laughs> many, oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I absolutely love, um, you know, well, I just love so many of them. Um, I know it's, I know it's a hard question. I How do love, I tell you mine? I'll tell you mine. Oh going yeah, through. please. Uh, mine was actually by um, Sylvia Acevedo, the engineer, yeah. uh, born in 57, a uh, rocket scientist. And it says, if you're prepared, you can be fearless. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly how I feel about everything I do. I prepare to the nines and then I can just go with it, you it's know? Great. And I was just like, that's, that's absolutely brilliant and perfect. So, and I feel like it's such a perfect quote for someone associated with Girl Scouts too. So exactly, yeah. exactly. Which I, I was, I was a Girl Scout, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is carried over into adulthood. Um, so I think to, to give a local flair, um, one of the people that I really have loved learning about is Ruth E. Carter, mm -hmm. who you may know, just she won the Oscar for designing the costumes for yes. Black Panther, and she grew up in Springfield, Mass. Um, and I, I really have loved discovering because she started out as um, a special ed major, and then she was such a theater buff that she decided to really pursue that. And um, so her quotation in the book is, be a student of your passion. And that was a great way. And, and you see what she's accomplished now um, and just the creativity. And she's such a researcher at heart in terms of how she comes across um, what's gonna inspire her costume selections. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. The, um, yeah. was it, she actually, I think was like a co-host of one of the sci-fi, um, there was a sci-fi show that she, I remember her talking about these different costumes and people were trying to do, I can't remember what it was, I'm sorry. Um, but I just remember hearing her and going, hey, she's from Springfield mm -hmm. and being very excited about that. Um, it, so the book itself, it's broken down, not to jump topics, but it's broken down into, I'm gonna call them different values by these words. Um, I'm putting a characterization on them uh, to create a way to support other women in this book about giving voice to women, but also creating a way to uh, create a lingual groundwork um, for, to inspire others. What, what was it about these word values these, that you felt helped encapsulate um, these particular women? So for example, Bravely is one of them, uh, Whitley, Whitley, I can't even say it now, um, <laughs> Whitley, Valiantly, uh, profoundly, et cetera, creatively. Uh, what was it that jumped out to you about those particular words that you found would help not only support, but create that? Yeah, I mean, we actually um, picked those themes. We were, um, uh, I, I mentioned before that we, we had a mountain of work to begin with, actually. Um, so, um, we started by trying to, first of all, you know, choose some of the words that we felt like there was a dearth of women's voices around. Um, um, and then since we were talking about US history, yeah, sort of um, um, values that we thought have been traditionally associated with US sort of uh, values. But um, we also had, um, been able to have a conversation with a couple of organizations um, when we were doing the research to, to kind of guide what we did. And, and one of those was the National Women's History Museum. So um, in talking with them, um, they actually had kind of picked some of their favorites uh, too. And so that helped pick. Um, so yeah, we were, we reached out to women to find out um, what sort of things that they valued. Um, uh, what qualities they thought were most important to be represented in the book. Uh, and that helped a lot uh, because Absolutely. there were- was, was there a particular value for each of you that you felt um, you resonated with you the most? And then was there a particular quote within those values that solidified your feeling around that? Um, 
So I think for your point about the values too, there are multiple touch points during a year where you will see quotations that will be gathered and shared. Yes. So it could be at Memorial Day, at 4th of July, at Labor Day, and they're talking about values when they're doing those collections. And I'll tell you, every major media out there is going to do it. That's a great example. We're still to this day, probably 15% or 20% of what's shared is going to be something by a woman. And so I think for me, um, one of the organizations that we also worked with was Women in Military Service, um, which actually has the most amazing um, location outside of Washington, DC. And so I had spent some time with these two um, former major generals and we talked to them. So I think part of it was honor that I, I'm a little stunned when I don't find women's voices associated with something that's such a core value as honor. Um, and so, you know, that would be kind of one of them. And I'd have to find the quote in there, but Alicia, do you wanna, um, you know, yeah, I, I have some, I can't choose one thing but one quote, you know, I mean, um, for um, when you were thinking about say which quotes kind of have been resonating with, with you, um, in the Gracefully chapter, we have uh, Aisha Ash, um, and she is um, a trailblazing uh, ballerina. And she was from Rochester, New York. And um, she, after she retired, uh, she ended up going back to her hometown um, and just going out in a tutu and performing in the streets, uh, like the roughest streets of Rochester, New York. Um, and the quote is, you never know the impact you can have just by being a present. So for me, that's kind of, connected with, you know, how to maintain a kind of daily grace. Um, but also, of course, as a ballerina, she connects with this sort of gracefully theme and the work that she's doing, I think, is very graceful. Um, so that, that's one that I kind of think about on a daily, a daily basis. Um, and then another one that, that I kind of unexpectedly resonated with me <laughs> was in the Purposely chapter. Um, we have this rancher um, named Beth Robinette, and her quote is, if you desire diversity, you have to create conditions for diversity to thrive. Um, when she said that, she was kind of talking about um, on her own, she's a holistic land manager. She, pra she practices as eco-friendly a form of ranching as she can. And so she was talking about biodiversity to a certain extent. Um, but she also realizes that she is in a male dominated profession. And so she started a, um, a program called new cowgirl camp so that she could start training up women to start filling these roles and changing the industry in doing that. And so again, she was consciously setting up the conditions for diversity in the industry. Um, so yeah, that's one that I, I think about a lot too. <laughs> now, speaking of the industry, when it comes to um, the current like Black Lives Matter, the uh, Parkland shooting um, teenagers, uh, even the current uh, unfortunate uh, attacks on Asian Americans, have you been looking at and collecting uh, quotes from those from th those groups, uh, particularly of uh, I'm trying to word that how to word this of uh, those leaders for the different values that you've seen in, in the different books. Um, so there's, or, there is um, a great deal of um, visible activism right now from a variety of people. And I think there are some wonderful uh, stories and assets behind those. Um, we, we right now, when we collect, if we come across something, we'll put it into our, you know, our system. Mm -hmm. But when Alicia and I, then we'll pull it out when we're going to share something or we want to look for something to share it. So finding those, I, th there's, I would say there's an abundance right now of things that we would love to go collect. Um, and it's a matter of time for us because there's actually a lot of very 
um, important thinking that's happening. We've seen like this era of firsts yeah. in addition to the social activism. Um, so I think right now is a great time to actually be in this collecting, um, <laughs> curating and sharing business. <laughs> and a lot of those people were, I mean, you know, um, Emma Gonzalez was on our list actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we have lots of her quotes in the system. Um, we we included uh, Tarana Burke, for instance, in our uh, Great and Grace, and we so yeah, we do have a lot of the voices and consciously um, try to get quotes from them for sure. I think um, it's important. We're I have to start wrapping things up, which I don't want to do because I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, the the question, one of the questions that's popping in my mind is, what do you, why do you, what and why do you think that the um, a, the space to be able to uh, find at least more women's quotes um, has come about. Do you think it's because of the internet? Do you think it's because of uh, the just extensive research? Do you think it's a combination of things? Or do you think people are also more willing to look into the past and say, oh yeah, we've had trailblazers doing this uh, and we need to reflect on what what they've done um, to be able to move forward in the future. Yeah, and that makes sense. I think it's because women sought them out, absolutely. Um, I, I guess my question is, uh, I want, I'm curious to know about these, gener our generations are looking more towards our female past. Um, and I'm curious to know what that, I'm, I'm, part of me also wants to know what that catalyst is. Like, I guess I'm a, I was born in 76, so am I a catalyst of that 70s feminism? Possibly, um, but the, the next question, I, you know, I'm just trying to think of what is it about us wanting to go back and say, okay, these people have done this, here are these quotes, how do I resonate with that? Do you know what I'm trying to say? And, I yeah, I mean, I, just, I think that history is such a fantastic resource, isn't it, to like, um, what we hope the book is doing, you know, I don't even know if we really said this, but of course the main priority of a book about US trailblazers is to inspire today's trailblazers. You know, it's, it's to give them tools, right? Right. Um, to help more trailblazers emerge. Um, and, you know, history is a fantastic resource for doing that. I think that these voices um, uh, and these stories really help people. I mean, they, I think, provide motivation, uh, inspiration, and also ideas, like, you know, for how, what you can do, how you can move forward and, and contribute. So, um, it, yeah, it's important to collect them because there's already so much out there that we can draw upon when, as, as we're moving forward and uh, blazing new trails. So we have a couple books, we have the journal, which um, I love, this is a wonderful journal. Um, and then you have the salutations and sign-offs. I'm curious to know, what is it about salutations and sign-offs that <laughs> intrigue you? Um, I, I, I actually try to put a lot of thought into my, in my act, because I actually still write letters to a couple of people, not like just emails. You know, I have some friends in college that we specifically write letters, um, which, surprises a lot of people, um, but it's it's just for us a way to take a moment to actually sit down and and, and just remind them that we're, we're still saying hi, you know, because we've been friends for 20 something years and we have fun writing, we do ciphers to each other, like that. little secrets. And I do that with my husband, you know, there's these, I'm just saying, I'm just curious to know, so what is it about these introductions and goodbyes that, that intrigue you? So imagine that our whole world is around short bits of content, right? <laughs> and, and how are we hunting for them and all? And I, a lot of what we're researching are from original letters, um, correspondence. And I think for us, it was just the personality that came through in how people would convey an opening or closing, or again, our thing is the story behind it. So, you know, for us, like something as simple as my love wrote Martha Washington to George, 
that in itself is not necessarily two words that are totally unique. However, she had destroyed all of their correspondence so that she could keep their private lives private. So then when you only find a couple of remaining notes that are discovered and one of them says, my love, and it's like scrawled off, then it becomes more important because you can tell a little bit of a history nugget um, in that story. So Alicia, if you want to. Oh yeah, no, I just think it's so fun. So, I mean, a lot of these opening and closings do make sort of, um, ideal messages for sending people to mark certain occasions. So there's, you know, it, it, they make nice note cards, but then there's like a little bit of intrigue because when you flip it over, then you realize that this was actually part of a, a correspondence that you might not have known about. So a lot of, we were also interested to find, um, include some relationships that you might not expect. Like, um, I like you very much. Uh, wrote Frida Kahlo to Georgia O'Keeffe and maybe you didn't realize that they you know these two icons of the art world were in correspondence with each other and that's that's actually very uh interesting so that, as, that was kind of intrigued us too. As a literary person um have you found um there were particular writers that jumped out at you more after having done this particular research? You mean into the letters? Yes. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's just <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I, I was thinking for, about like Zelda Fitzgerald. She's oh, yeah, a Canadian yeah. writer in her own right yeah. that yeah. no one really knows about, and some think that uh, Scott stole quite a few of his ideas from her. Oh yeah. You know, so it's um, you know, the one of the salutations uh, or you know sign offs that you have is from Zelda to Scott. And so it's just, you know, I'm curious what your opinion of it is, you know, because there's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of brilliant women who are overshadowed by their, the, by the men in their lives. Yeah. And I was just curious to know if you found that in the letters also, and that's kind of what I'm thinking, asking. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that, so um, the next book we have coming out is actually, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, is going to be a, a sort of a, you know about along those lines. Um, so it is going to be about correspondence and quotes from correspondence and um, definitely salutations and sign offs, but also a few fine lines thrown in uh, as well. Um, and a lot of the correspondence that we found that was particularly interesting was sort of revealing. Um, relationships that maybe famous men had with women that you might not expect where there was a uh, mentoring or a, a patronage or you know a kind of muse relationship that you might not have been aware of and yeah. so in um, finding this correspondence that exists and was saved because uh, it's associated with some famous man um, it's actually helping us reveal some of those hidden stories that you might not know about. So I think, yeah, that's been some of the fun things about doing doing the research for sure. And also one thing that we just found that I was really excited about that Pauline, Pauline, you actually found this was the, um, the I don't know if it's called cuneiform text. Yep. Um, yes. So um, a lot of those sort of earliest forms of the course, Babylonian oh, yeah, they, they found um, were being written by women, like these business women, um, oh. that, you know, no one knew about these Assyrian business women. And uh, yep. <laughs> so it's, yep. it's, again, yep. it's, it's another way of kind of revealing these histories that we're not familiar with. And, um, and the writing was actually quite fun, too. But <laughs> oh, very cool. Very, very cool. <laughs> yeah, when I think of cuneiform, all the stuff that I've seen usually is like uh, weights and measures, you know, or how yeah. many things have gone from here to there. But to realize that women have been, you know, we've been working a long time. So <laughs> it's a matter of we're doing stuff. It's out there. It's just about sometimes finding that language. Right. So thank you all for doing this. I think it's a, it's a wonderful series. Um, are you, I'm curious to know, are you going to be expanding, working on, you're doing the salutate, uh, sign up, excuse me, salutations and sign offs coming up book um but is there are you going to be expanding this anymore is there more um note cards coming out or journals or anything like that also 
So our first thing is the manuscript for the new one is due like in May, <laughs> so okay. we're busy. Um, but you know, we would love to do some children's books if we can find the right way to, again, it's words and stories and then visuals. Yep. Um, we, we actually have a number of things we have pitched around different themes. And so it's just finding the right place where, um, because our, our thing is like, how do you get it out in a print way that's clever that can then link it back to our online site? So there's, there's not a shortage of ideas <laughs> it's, there's actually a well-known illustrator here in town that i can um that oh. for Scho uh, scholastic that might be interested so i'll great pass that along if if you're interested that'd be great and my western mass home is so badly and actually okay. part of bravely i did write in the library i would go there when i first moved here um which was only about a year and a half ago when it was open <laughs> and yep. um and it's a lovely place to write so oh yeah it's um the dam and the water can be very inspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, where I sit, um, I see the sunset and it hits me directly in the face every day. <laughs> However, um, I do find sometimes it, it gives me a moment or two as I'm walking downstairs, usually just to go take something. I usually take a look out and see what's going on. Is there any squirrels having a good day, sunning themselves <laughs> or maybe some swans or birds? So I try to at least take a moment to, to do that. Um, the biggest thing I wanted to also mention once again is that these materials are available at Odyssey Bookshop. Um, you can get them there um, and I believe you can order them. Is that correct? That's or, right. Okay. Yep. And uh, to please, please go in there and do that. And then thank you for coming. I had a wonderful time today. I hope you did too. You're a um, marvelous host. A lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you very so much. much. That's right. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope you didn't mind me drinking my hot cocoa. That's all right. We were adult responsibility <laughs> one way utter nonsense the other way and I figure brain and heart I don't know if you're a big fan of them but I think they're funny so oh, that's great uh, yeah uh, for me I'm, I'm a hot cocoa drinker so sparkles or, you know sprinkles and hot cocoa and marshmallows so it's all good <laughs> delicious. So thank you very much for coming uh, I'm gonna stop the recording here in a second great. thanks everybody mouse stop thank you, thank you.